House hacking. What is it? Should you do it? I did it, and I'm gonna tell the you. The single best financial decision you can make, house hacking. House hacking is the most financially advantageous way to own a home. House hacking. House hacking. Essentially what house hacking means is you own a building or a home and you find ways to generate income from that home while still living in it, AKA people are paying all of your mortgage or part of your mortgage. House hacking is a glorified way of saying that you own a house and have roommates. I've seen a lot of videos on this and as someone that did house hacking for two years, I think there's some people making it sound like it's easier than it actually is to do. I just wanna give you my real life experience of house hacking, how it worked for me. Before we get into it, this video is sponsored by Kuba Casa and you're gonna to wanna to listen to this because they are really helpful for house hackers, homeowners, realtors, renters, AKA like everyone out there. Kuba Casa is an app that has a mobile capture technology where you can scan a house, a townhouse, a condo, maybe even my Airstream, maybe I should try that. And it creates a floor plan for you. It can do it in as little as five minutes and it's free. You go into a house, you open the app, you scan the floor plan, it's got really simple directions to follow, upload it, and you receive your floor plan. Real estate agents out there, you're gonna want this. I don't know about you, but I get asked probably half the time by my clients if a home has a floor plan. In the past, I hated saying no. So it's awesome having Kuba Casa because not only can I just tell them about it if they wanna create their own floor plan, or I can do it for them and I feel like I'm providing so much more value to them as a realtor, so you're definitely gonna wanna download it. It's available in over 170 countries and they recently made it free in the US because they believe floor plans should be free and easy to access. It's in the Apple Store and the Google Play Store. I'm going to have it linked below. Thanks again to Kuba Casa for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now the biggest thing I hear with house hacking is people living completely for free. This really came on the scene with multifamily units. So you'd buy a fourplex and you'd live in one of them and the other three would generate enough revenue where it would pay not only their own portions but also yours. Well, that is incredible. It's not realistic in every market. It's definitely not realistic in my market of Seattle. I'll, I'll show you a couple examples here. There's not a lot of inventory with multifamily in Seattle in general, but I'm going to show you just a couple options. This is probably the cheapest you can get, $775,000 for a duplex. They're renting one of the units for $1,800 and the other for about $2,000. They're getting like almost $4,000 a month from it. But with this purchase price, you might start to break even but there's no way you're gonna be able to rent out like a two bed, two bath in this area of Seattle for close to $4,000 a month to cover your mortgage too. You get what I'm saying? Here's another option. This is another duplex. Like I would live in that. It's nice. These are two bedroom, one bathroom units. They're able to get 2,500 a month. Again, at best, you're kind of getting close to breaking even if you're putting like 30% down. You can't just like live in one of these units and rent the other out for $5,000 a month. The Seattle market, you just can't really do it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't house hack. There's still ways where it can be really advantageous for you. And we'll get into my story. So here's my house. I bought it in 2019 for $770,000. So I've got a bedroom on the bottom with its own bathroom, the middle floor. So it separates that bottom bedroom. And then the top floor has two bedrooms and two bathrooms of their own. I bought this house with 10% down and a 4.5% interest rate. And my monthly payment was $4,700 a month. Now I'm not going to be able to get two roommates in here covering all $4,700 for me. It's just not gonna happen. And I was okay with that. That was not my expectation. The way I wanted to house hack was to just offset some of my mortgage. I occupied the primary bedroom and bathroom and the garage. The bottom bedroom, although really small, you'd be surprised, like people will still rent it. So for that, I charged $950 a month. And then the second bedroom upstairs was a little bit bigger, a little bit more natural light in a bigger bathroom. So that one I charged $1,150 a month. In rental income, I was getting $2,100 a month and I was paying at $2,600 a month. I know that doesn't sound really, really, really amazing, but let me break it down a little bit more for you. Of my $2,600 a month, let's not forget I'm paying my mortgage where $900 a month was going towards principal. So that was the equity and that forced savings there. Effectively, it's really like I was paying $1,500 a month, but I own the house and every month it's appreciating. After the first year of owning it, the townhouse next to me went went for sale and it sold for 830,000. So in my first year of ownership, my house appreciated $58,000. If we divide that 58,000 over 12 months, it's as if my house was paying me $4,800 a month just for me owning it. Do you see what I mean? Do you see when you dive into that math, the appreciation
renovation of my home, plus the rental income, plus the principal payment that I'm getting. Although out of pocket every month, you know, I was paying 2,600, but by simply owning the property in the principal payments, I was making 5,700. So overall I was netting $3,100 a month just for living in my house. And then the next year something really cool happened. Interest rates just plummeted. I was able to refinance and I got my payment from $4,700 a month down to $3,700 a month overnight. Okay, I will say my house appreciated a lot more than I expected that it would have in the first year as a lot of people who bought in 2019, 2020 have experienced. I did not go into it with that expectation. I went into it with the most conservative expectation. I thought at 2019, I was buying at the top of the market. And so for me, I was super happy with those numbers because my goal wasn't like, okay, I don't wanna pay anything monthly and live for free. So if this sounds like something that you would want to do, stick around because now I'm gonna talk about my best practices for how I did this. First, finding the right home. Like I said, I went with a townhouse because I feel like it's really conducive to co-living situations. Now let's go check out a couple properties. If I were to house hack today, what I would be looking for, this townhouse, it's listed right at a million dollars. It's in in East Lake. It's three bed, two and a half bath, 1,500 square feet. I think this one could have a pretty ideal layout for house hack. This house opens to just a main little foyer area and then you can either go up the stairs or to this hallway down a set of stairs where you have two bedrooms and a bathroom. Here is your full bathroom. One bedroom here, decent sized closet, and one bedroom here. I know you're probably thinking, are you serious? This bedroom is so small, but I'm telling you, I think with these you could get $900 each from them. And then you have just two roommates living down here, self-contained, and you have a ton of separation from your bedroom. I'll show you. Coming up the stairs. Here is the living room area right here. Coming up these stairs, you have a kitchen and dining space. And then we'll go up to the primary bedroom. So super spacious, nice vaulted ceilings, your ensuite bathroom. And to top it all off, you've got your own private little balcony. Pricing the house. So you get the house, you know which room you wanna occupy. How do you know what to price these homes at? I found Facebook Marketplace and Facebook housing groups to be the best tool because these show what people really are paying for co-living. You're only gonna be able to get so much, right? Before someone goes, I'm not gonna live in a shared space. I'm just gonna go off and get my own one bedroom. The average rent for a one bedroom in Seattle is $2,300. So it's safe to say you're never really gonna at $2,300 or even really close to that because at that point someone's just gonna go rent their own thing. It's always like a little bit more ideal than sharing a space, right? What I tended to find was a small bedroom could rent at the very least for $900 a month and a bigger bedroom was going for up to $1,500 a month. And then from there you think to yourself, well, how does my room stack up to that, right? So I honestly, I didn't really use any other resource except for Facebook. I think it's so helpful if you're just trying to find a place to rent or you're trying to rent your stuff out. So you know how much you want to charge. How do you find the right tenant? One thing I did that I think really had me attracting the right kinds of tenants was I decided to furnish the living spaces myself. I made the spaces look really good. I made sure my house looked way better than all of the other things being posted on Facebook. And by doing that, of course, I got so many people reaching out. If you're worried, oh, people aren't really gonna wanna rent my place, yes, they will. And at least in the state of Washington, because I own or occupy it, there's really no fair housing rules on who you pick. Ultimately, when it came to picking tenants, I let several people stop by and I just picked people based on if I thought I could get along with them, you know, we could potentially be friends. We certainly don't have to be friends. We don't have to hang out, but I have to feel like, you know, I can get along with you, right? And so that's what I did. I just picked people that I felt were fairly similar to me. Maybe I got lucky, but I had really amazing roommates. They were really great about cleaning up after themselves. They're really nice. We're friends. We're still friends to this day. There's really never any problems. My other best practice would be consider letting it be a flexible lease to an extent. I wanted some form of commitment from my tenants in the beginning where I was like, you know, I would like it to be, you'd want to be here for a year, but if you don't like it, you can leave. I just want a 30 day heads up. You're living with 
with these people, you don't want them to not want to live there or resent the space. With that said, you could present things. If you're trying to maximize your profit, a strategy you could use is could say six month lease and charge a little bit more, right? That's normal in the rental market. Like a 12 month lease is $3,000 a month. And then a six month lease might be $3,500 a month because you have a little more flexibility, right? I guess you could, if you really wanted, you could charge for a little bit of that flexibility, a bit of a premium. You could probably make more money off having a 30 day rental furnished bedroom. Then you're advertising to the nomad type, the traveling nurse type, people that know they have to kind of pay a premium for that flexibility. So that is something you could do. I wish I would have tried that, but I didn't. Now, where am I at today? Well, I don't house hack anymore. That was my end goal. When I went into buying the property, I did not need three bedrooms and three bathrooms. So ultimately, I wouldn't have bought a townhouse if I wasn't gonna house hack. I would have just bought, say, a one bedroom condo. But I'm really so glad I did what I did because two and a half years later, now I'm living in the townhouse without roommates, with my boyfriend, our two dogs. I've been able to convert the townhouse to grow as I've grown in my life. And when you're buying real estate, it's a pretty long-term thing. Like you wanna hold it at least four to five years to actually make a good profit on it, less all the buying and selling costs associated, right? For me, I'm just so glad that that's what I did because if I would have in 2019 just bought a one bedroom condo, I know two and a half years later today, I would have felt like it doesn't fit my needs anymore. It's not big enough. If I were still single, I would still have roommates in there. I would still totally like living with people I knew it would be up until I was probably living, you know, with someone in a relationship that I'd be ready to be done with the house hacking. And so if you are someone that can afford to buy a house, you're single, you've lived with people before and you don't mind it, it really, it, it can be a, an amazing thing to build wealth and I would highly recommend doing it. It's your house, you can do things on your own terms, you write your own rules. So that's my whole story and thoughts on house hacking. If you want more information about the house that I bought, I have a couple other videos about breaking down the financing, the closing costs, things like that. I will have a playlist linked below. And if you are looking to buy or sell real estate in the Seattle Bellevue metro area and you have any questions at all, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.